for the reading of God's Word this morning. Our text is Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4. I'm going to do something this morning I don't think I have ever done in all my years of preaching. That is, I am going to actually read from the old King James. Second Timothy chapter 4. We want to talk about come before winter. For context, I'd like for us to begin at verse 6. This is generational. It is a father speaking to his spiritual son. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading, and then immediately afterwards we'll pray together. And after the prayer, you may be seated. For context, let's begin at verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Crestus, has gone to Galatia, Titus has gone unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, at my first court defense, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesephorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletus sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Prudence, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord of all, we come before your throne. And Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We humble ourselves before your word. We pray for open hearts, open minds. May we see the power and the intent of these inspired words. Not only for a young man named Timothy, but for us as well. May we be mentored by your word. Bless your word to your people. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. I brought my mother's Bible with me this morning. Last night I was looking over the Bible verses that she has written inside of the front cover and the back cover. This is not the old King James. This is the Revised Standard. When I was a Little boy, my mom made the decision that she was going to get for her own personal study Bible a revised standard. My dad was a holdout. He kept on to the King James, uh, I think almost until he retired. And at some point, my mother, along with my sister's help, snuck in a new King James. And I don't know if he ever noticed the difference or not, but there were a lot of things that I think were a little clearer. I've been thinking a lot in preparation for the things to share today from this incredible text. I've been thinking a lot about generation. The generational nature of this text. And how it is from a father to a son, and how it is from a mentor to the one being mentored. I've also thought a lot about how absolutely unique this text is. There are so many texts in Scripture that uh, have a parallel text. Now, we definitely know that in the Gospels. But even sometimes in Paul's own writings, we can lay side by side things that he has said uh, to the Ephesians that he also says to the Colossians. And we can compare and we can contrast. The text that is before us, the very last words penned by the Apostle Paul just shortly before his death, are absolutely and totally unique in all of the landscape of God's inspired words. The context for these words, the time of my departure is at hand. 
Paul was always keenly aware of timing and God's rhythm. The time of my departure is at hand. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. And he puts us in the context of a drink offering. And for context, we go back to the Old Testament. We go back to the book of Leviticus, but more accurately, we go back to the book of Numbers. And the worship procedure of a drink offering, it accompanied other offerings. It is called, again in the old King James, a libation. And the worshiper or the priests, would pour it out. Tradition says that they would pour it from shoulder height. And they would pour the wine out until the cup was empty. Paul says, I'm ready to be offered. I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. Now, while at first, we may think that he's saying, I'm about to die. I'm about to give it all to the last drop of my blood. And don't you know, those that remember the old coffee commercial, it'll be good for the last drop. But there's another layer to this. When we go back and we understand, as obviously Paul did, as being such a student of the law, every time the drink offering is mentioned, it, it always came with this um, caveat. When you are in the land, you shall provide for the Lord a drink offering. Leviticus and Numbers were written by Moses before the children of Israel came into the land. Which tells us that during the 40 years of wandering, the children of Israel never offered a drink offering because the command was specific. When you are in the land, you shall give this to the Lord. The drink offering was associated with the Sabbath. It was associated with rest. You see, the children of Israel didn't have rest until they entered into the rest of the promised land. And there is a sense in which we understand even more that Paul means. Because this isn't the only place that he has referenced himself being a drink offering. When he writes to the church at Philippi, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul speaks of his life being a drink offering that he is pouring out on the sacrifice, on the altar, in the context. Paul says, I'm, I'm being poured out on the altar of sacrifice of God's people, of you Philippians, now look at what Paul is saying to Timothy. I am a drink offering. I'm being poured out. Yes, my life is about to be over, and I'll give every ounce, every drop to the very end of my life's blood for the cause of Christ. But Timothy, I am pouring out my drink offering unto the Lord, unto you. You are the land. You are the kingdom. You are the next generation that will take this baton 
And what we are reading, God is pouring out. Paul is pouring out every last drop like anointing oil on the head of his beloved Timothy. Now that's the context of all the things that Paul has on his heart and he wants to share. Paul is an old man. He is 65 when he dies. He's an old 65. Because he has been through so much, he has been beaten with rods. He has been stoned and left for dead. Think about that. Stoned and left for dead. And where was it that he was stoned and left for dead? Lystra. Where's Timothy from? Lystra. Paul meets this young man. This young man who, Luke, Luke, Luke the historian and Luke the storyteller, always loves to set things up in the context of a foil. You know what a foil is? Dastardly, Dick Dastardly curses foiled again in reference to Dudley Do-Right, right? A foil is an exact opposite. And in literature, it, it becomes this great device. And so Luke sets up Barnabas giving his complete free will offering and lays it at the apostles' feet and then the foil becomes Ananias and Sapphira. But don't let it escape your notice that Luke also sets up a young man named Mark who abandons Paul, who abandons the Lord's work. And now a young man named Timothy. And the account in the book of Acts reads, that everyone, everyone speaks well of Timothy, not only in the hometown boy context of Lystra, but also those over in the other city of Iconium. They speak well of Timothy. And you know the only way you can do that is if he had been active and he had shown himself a good man. In both places. It is reasonable. It is reasonable to collect the dots. That when Paul is stoned in Timothy's hometown by those that are so opposed to the gospel, and he is left for dead, that means everyone else goes away and leaves him there. that the faithful in Lystra were the ones that came out and helped Paul. Picked up the rocks and moved them. Lifted him up and helped carry him into the city. Why was it that Paul had such a bond with Timothy? It may have been that Timothy witnessed all of that. And when Paul speaks of stoned and left for dead, Timothy just nods. Yeah. And he's not exaggerating. This Paul shipwrecked. And he hangs on to a piece of a boat. Not a boat. A piece of a boat. Hangs on to it, but puts his faith and his trust in the Lord. To see him through to safety. This Paul. 
this giant among the apostles. But this man, historical records, the best they can tell us was that he wasn't very tall. They describe him and tell us that he was bald, which means he had to be a very handsome and good-looking man. <laughs> no, in fact, the record would indicate otherwise. Somewhat stooped over, poor eyesight. He never thought of himself as a great orator. And while I think he is the prince of preachers, this anointed convict, he never saw himself as a great speaker. And those of us that preach take great comfort from the fact that on the one night that Paul is especially long-winded, there is a young man who falls asleep. It is this Paul. This Paul, who is pouring out his drink offering on this young man, Timothy. Come before winter. Twice, Paul says, be diligent with all of your energy. Make the effort to come before winter. It's the passing of the baton. Soon Paul will be gone. We rejoice in the completed work of Christ on the cross. Amen? It is all God's plan. But I tell you what, don't ever forget that Paul is the mouthpiece through whom God explains. His plan of salvation. If we didn't have the Apostle Paul, what would we preach? It is Paul who explains to us the mystery of godliness. It is Paul who explains to us the importance and the significance of being united with Christ in baptism. It is Paul who explains to us how it is that we by faith are Abraham's offspring. Those of us who have been clothed with Christ. It is Paul who explains to us that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, through all and in all. It is Paul who explains to us what it means that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is this Paul, this servant, this mouthpiece, who says the time of my departure is at hand and the baton is being passed on. Timothy, come, come before winter. Time. Time of my departure. Time is so precious. It is the one commodity that all of us have. It is the greatest resource all of us have. 
If somebody wastes your money, you can make more money. But if somebody wastes your time, do you understand that this moment right now is precious? We can never get it back. And in fact, we can never replicate it. If we all come back next Sunday and we all sit in exactly the same places, and if we all wear exactly what we are wearing today, it will not be the same moment. It will not be the same. This moment will have passed. And if the Lord Jesus delays in coming, next Sunday will be a different moment. It is in the context of seasons that Paul says, come before winter. It means some things. It implies some things. Winter, it will be too late. It will be too late because Paul is keenly aware he won't be alive come winter. There's also a practical aspect of this. Timothy, we understand, is in Ephesus. Paul is in Rome. Timothy has a great assignment. He's working with the church at Ephesus. He's got the job. He's got the responsibility of guiding and leading that congregation to the point where they can appoint elders. He is there doing the work and the ministry of an evangelist. He's been placed there by Paul, and Paul is the one who said, Timothy, you have not been given a spirit of fear. Be strong. but come before winter. You see that nearly 1,000 miles from Ephesus to Rome, it would have to be traversed over land and over sea. And in the winter, boats do not sail on the Mediterranean, not in the first century. It was too dangerous. And so the appeal is you've got to come. You've got to come now. Because now is the opportunity. Now is the season. A season will come when there will be no opportunity. Come before winter. Paul nurtures Timothy. He nurtures him and... He teaches him. We said this is a unique text, and it is. And yet, like so many other texts, we get to be there in the room where it happened. All this week, I, I kept thinking about, my mind kept going back to the incredible opportunity that several of us had to be in the Mamertine prison. This prison. This cave. And even in March, in the spring, when the weather is very mild, very comfortable, to be down in that cave, only a hole in the ceiling by which Paul would have been let down into that prison chamber. How cold. How damp. And it is from here that Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Come, come before winter. 
I'm cold. Bring your warmth. And Paul takes the time to instruct this young man. And Paul, we would say, is being totally transparent. And he lists everyone who is gone. It's interesting, and I encourage you to do this in my NIV. I have gone in and I've circled the three verbs that Paul uses in regards to those who are gone. Demetrius, he says, has abandoned. He is deserted. And I have that word circled. Then there are others who have gone. And then there is the one that Paul said, I sent. And those verb actions are so different. The desertion, inexcusable. Those who are busy and have gone out to proclaim the gospel in other places, God bless you. And the one that Paul sent for that very purpose, totally understandable. Only Luke, only Luke is with me. And as Paul is describing, and then he gets to his point and says, at my first defense, no one stood with me. Paul is writing to a young man, a young man who is going to serve as a preacher. And he says, mark it down. There are going to be brethren that let you down. There are going to be brethren that disappoint you. There are going to be people, Timothy, that you thought you could count on Tell you what, would you agree that's a hard life lesson? It's a reality. Don't let anybody ever tell you that Christianity is all about health and wealth and prosperity. But I tell you what, I don't think I would have anyone, <laughs> I wouldn't want to have anyone mentor me to that life truth other than Paul. Did you notice that even in the context, he says, Timothy, go, go grab Mark, your, your foil. Go grab Mark and bring him. He's profitable. He's profitable to me for ministry. And Luke, Luke is with me. Tetricus I left sick in Miletus. Interesting, interesting. The Apostle Paul, who has performed miracles and has raised the dead. Now in these later years, as the gospel is being more and more confirmed by the completed canon of Scripture, now has this beloved instrument of the Lord that he leaves behind in Miletus sick. Do you see the perspective from which Paul is writing and he is pouring into this young man? And he says, Timothy, mark it down. You've got to build into your life a percentage that allows for betrayal. But now, let's take advantage of that old King James. But notwithstanding. 
the Lord stood with me. What a great perspective. What a great perspective. And understand, understand, Paul has said, the Lord has delivered me out of the lion's mouth, and he shall, he will deliver me again. But Paul is not under any kind of assumption that he is going to be physically delivered out of the Mamertine prison pit. He will be delivered through it. Paul knows something about prisons. He knows something about being delivered from prison. No doubt, no doubt, as Paul is there in this confinement, the prince of preachers, he thinks back to another time earlier in his career when he, alongside of Silas, are in another prison. And at midnight, they are committed to singing hymns and praising their God singing hymns which are instructional, singing hymns for the benefit of the other prisoners that are there and are listening. And when God's people are engaged in worship and praise and proclamation, look what God does. God comes down. And there is an earthquake. Acts chapter 16, there in the city of Philippi, the gospel has come to Europe now for the very first time. And for the proclamation of the gospel, Paul and Silas are arrested. Their feet placed in stocks. And in the innermost prison, they are singing praises. And there is an earthquake, a miraculous, only God could do earthquake. And all the doors are opened and all the shackles have been set free. And you know the story. Remember the story. The jailer, as a Roman jailer, is responsible for the lives of the prisoners. And if they escape, he has to pay with his own life. Rather than die at the hands of other Roman soldiers, he is prepared to take his own life. And Paul cries out, Do not hurt yourself. We are all here. We are all here. Don't do yourself any harm because the Lord, He did not create this earthquake so that we could escape. He created this earthquake so he could step in. It is that Paul who now writes and knows, I will be delivered through the prison, not out of it. Come. Before winter. You have the opportunity now. And take advantage of it. Timothy no doubt had to say. There's so much going on in Ephesus right now. It isn't like he just hops on a plane. It will take days, weeks. It will take days of preparation. To go. And he's got to time it. It's got to be in the right rhythm. If he gets there too late and the last boat has sailed, he'll have to wait till spring. And if he waits till spring, the opportunity is gone. Come before winter. And then, make note of the fact that Paul, in instructing this young man and making sure that he understands what it is that 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because the Lord stood with me. Others abandoned me. And that was a disappointment. But then he goes into detail and he tells Timothy, you watch out for Alexander. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. And you watch out for him. He did everything he could to distort our message, our preaching. He twisted the gospel. I've often looked at this text and wondered and thought, wow. What do you do with this text when you're preaching on gossip? I want you to understand something. Gossip is gossip if it's true or not. And it's told by someone other than whose right it is to tell. That's gossip. This is Paul's right to tell. It happened to him. And he is telling Timothy to watch out. And as Paul often does, he speaks in terms of methods and ideologies and philosophies that can capture the mind and the heart. Watch out for those. This time, it's encapsulated in a living, breathing human being. Watch out for Alexander the coppersmith. And then he says, and again, look at the perspective. The Lord will reward him for what he has done. I listened to a lot of sermons this week. It's really, really interesting. If you Google, come before winter sermons. There are a lot of sermons titled, Come Before Winter. I found this really interesting. October 15th, 1915, in the city of Philadelphia, uh, a man by the name of Reverend McCarthy preached a sermon that he called, Come Before Winter. It so moved the congregation, they asked him to preach it again every year before winter. And he did for 37 years. Whoa. listening to sermons about come before winter. It's interesting to me, as one preacher talking about Alexander the coppersmith, and when Paul says, the Lord will reward him. The preacher said, you know what that is? That's Christian cussing. <laughs> That's how Christians cuss somebody out. The Lord reward you. The truth is that Paul is echoing the exact same thing that we see in the short, small letter of Jude. Jude chapter 1. It only has one chapter. And there Jude describes an event that we wish we had more details about where Moses and Satan, not Mo or Michael the archangel and Satan are disputing over the body of Moses. I'll get it right. And as detestable as that was, as in the wrong as Satan was, as ever anyone ever could be, Michael, the archangel, the general of God's armies, would not take it upon himself 
to pronounce judgment on Satan. But said, the Lord rebuke you. I don't know if you have ever been in the room when it happened. When somebody rebuked another brother or sister with those words, I have. The Lord rebuke you. This is the context and this is the instruction that Paul is giving to this young man, Timothy, and our time is gone, but I want you to understand there are three things. There are three things that Paul asks him to bring. Yes, bring Mark. But he asks for three things. Bring my coat. My cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus. Timothy, please, Come before winter, but stop off in Troas and get my coat. And the books. Oh, bring me the books. But especially bring me the parchments. The books. The Old Testament scriptures. That Paul can pour over. He's about to die. Give me the Bible we used to sing. Hold thy word before my closing eyes. And bring me especially the parchments. Now, the parchments, these would have been sheets of vellum, specially prepared animal skins, very expensive, on which to write. There are some that are saying, Paul is saying, bring me the letters that I've written. Bring me the books, Old Testament scripture, and bring me the letters that I've written. And perhaps that's exactly what Paul wants to do. He wants to compare the mystery of godliness now as he is seeing it and he's making all these connections. The very things he has argued in synagogues from Jerusalem to Rome. But in all likelihood, the parchments that he's asking for are blank pieces of paper. While I am sure that Paul recognizes the time of my departure is at hand. Oh, for the joy of being God's instrument and to write even just one more word to his people. Come before winter. I promise you, it was just a minute ago that I was 30. I can remember hitting 40 and putting on a brave face and saying, well, you know, 40 is the new 30. but I can remember feeling old at 40. Well, of course, because that's the oldest you've ever been. You've never known anything else but younger. It's interesting, the, the span and the spectrum 
We call Timothy a young man. And he may have only been a teenager at the time that Paul first met him. But as Timothy is serving as an evangelist and as Paul writes to him the first and second letter, there are those that would stretch it all the way to the fact that Paul is 40. And so all along as I matured, my sister was so glad when I turned 30. She said, now you're legitimate. Now you're the age that Jesus was. And now you can actually be a preacher because you're 30. And at every step of the way, I, I, I would see Timothy through those eyes. I tell you what, here I am now 60. I don't want to be Paul. I don't want to be the mentor. But I know I have to be. Because if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? Come before winter. Beloved, if you have something you're going to do, do it now. If you have something you need to do, do it now. If you have a relationship you need to restore, restore it now. If you have a book you need to write, write it now. If you have somebody that you need to hug, hug them now. I know there's a virus. Hug them now. If there's some place you need to go, go now. If there's some act of, of mission work that you need to do, do it now. Come before winter. I want to pray over us, and the lesson will be yours. Right where you are, I don't know, this, this message is for somebody. Right where you are. Let's pray. Lord, we pray. that you will help us to reach the place we were supposed to reach. Lord, we pray that you help us to find the coat, your forgiveness, this coat of forgiveness, this coat of your grace and your mercy and your wisdom. Help us to find the power of your word, your books, and apply them to our life. And help us to write our story in compliance with your will for our lives. Help us to reach the place we were supposed to get to. Lord, our prayer is that when our winter comes, that we will not find ourselves only halfway there. Lord, help us, like Paul, to finish the course. Help us, Lord, to provide your warmth, to your people, And Lord, our prayer, as we constantly pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. May we put it in the words of the Apostle Paul, Lord, come before winter. We are a people who recognize that you are worthy of praise. 
and we lift up our thanks. We lift up our praise. We lift up our supplications and our requests, all in the mighty name, the matchless name, the only name of Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, King of kings, Lord of lords, perfect Lamb. In His name, and His name alone, we dare to come before you. And all God's people said,